Buzz had this mean streak that he lacked. Buzz carried a fake cop's badge and coerced head out of hookers. Fuck that. Holding it in was better. It was warm out. A summer storm brewed. Crutch took a drive. He circled up the Hollywood Boulevard and out to the strip. He looked at people. The long-haired girls jazzed him and the long-haired guys rubbed him wrong. He trawled for that 62 bird and Scotty's blowjob bandits. He saw two fags in a 61 bird and no more. He drove east to Hancock Park. He cut his lights and perched at 2nd and Plymouth. That big Spanish house held him. Window glow flickered upstairs and down. He saw Chrissy in USC sweats, one glimpse and gone. He saw Dana tie her hair back in the kitchen. Buzz didn't get it. Nobody got it. That's why he never told anyone. It wasn't Chrissy Lunt. It was always Dana Lunt. And she was 53 years old. <laughs> Ladies and gentlemen, my great pleasure to introduce Don Crutchfield. What do you say, brother? What do you say? What do you say? What do you say? Uh, nine years ago, I met James Elroy. Uh. Now, I had read American Tabloid, and uh, there was a guy named Fred Otash in the book. He was a private detective. Now, he was a contemporary of Clyde Duber, who was my boss. And I grew up with the Dubers, and that's how I became a private investigator. I knew when I was 14, I wanted to be a private eye. When I was 18, I started doing the work. It's the only thing I ever wanted in my life except being in a James Elroy novel, of course. <laughs> and, uh, and so, uh, anyway, I went to one of his book signings, and I wrote this book, Confessions of a Hollywood P.I., which you can buy here, incidentally. But uh, I wanted to give this to James, and he was signing a book to me. And he says, what's this about? And I says, well, it's about, it's about Marlon Brando, it's about Michael Jackson, it's about Jerry Lewis, uh, it's about the Beatles, it's uh, on and on and on. And then I told him about the Wheelmen. Now, the Wheelmen were real people. I mean... We were a group of surveillance experts, and this was before the no-fault divorce. Uh, and in those days, to get a divorce, it, it was a bitch. You couldn't just walk in and say, I want a divorce. Uh, you had to prove adultery was one of the main things. And so, believe me, we worked 16 hours a day, seven days a week, and I couldn't wait to get to work because it was a high-speed surveillance. There's no high in the world like that. And... Uh, and, you know, I didn't make a lot of money, but I had, I had that fast-ass GTO, and uh, <laughs> nobody was going to lose me. And, uh, well, you know, we would, uh, uh, when we would follow people into a nightclub, well, then it was all in the expense account. So it was party time all the time. And I got to tell you, upstairs here, I, I got a 60s flashback when I walked in here because there was a hell of a bar up there at one time, and you could see forever up there. And one of the great times I remember... I was here at closing. They closed it and left me in the bar and some other people. I got about 5 in the morning, but it's a great time, let me tell you. Uh, but uh, the wheelmen were characters. I mean, these guys would have a pad around Fairfax or around Hollywood or something. Uh, they were shacked up with a bimbo. They, 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 had, uh, uh, they had broken families, broken homes and stuff like that. They didn't care about their, their appearance all that much but they cared about their cars. And, it, and I, I saw the movie Ten Men, and it kind of reminded me of the wheelmen, because when the new cars had come out, they'd all be down there. Because cars changed every year in those days, you know. And so it was faster, better, because they lived in those cars. And there was a gas station. So I'm telling him about this, the wheelman, and he's really getting interested in it. And, uh, and so I said, and of course, then there was the wrong door raid. And uh, I said, that changed the way that... that uh, private investigators do business in the state of California.
because there was a law that said any spouse can go anywhere the other spouse goes, even if it means kicking a door down. So uh, we had a group of people. I mean, this was all organized. You had one guy to bust the door down. This was a, a, a robbery cop named Jimmy. I never seen him take two whacks at a door. I always took it down the first time. And, and then you had, uh, you had uh, two guys standing next to the photographer. He'd get the pictures of him in the motel room, and then they'd close in front of him so nobody got the camera. Then you'd go over to the motel guy, and you'd pay him 40 bucks for the door. You know it only costs 25 but you're hoping he won't call the police on you. I mean, you're okay, but you're going to have to do some explaining, as long as you had the spouse there. So, um, Marilyn Monroe is married to Joe DiMaggio. And so, uh, uh, he suspects her of playing around. And so, Phil Irwin, one of the wheelmen he talks about here, he, he was following Marilyn Monroe every night. And, and so, she would go to this, uh, this apartment building, and she was having an affair, and um, uh, Sinatra was kind of propping up DiMaggio, and so he was always with him. Phil would come back and say, yeah, she went to the same place again. The manager would just break down and cry. He loved her so much. And Frank says, look, I know you loved her, but I know you love her, but it's time to kick the door down, which means, you know, you get the lion's share of the community property, you know, and, and that's what it was all about in those days. So uh, a bunch of private eyes uh, were at the, uh, a Patsy D. Moore's Villa Capri, and Sinatra was there. He owned a piece of the place. And, uh, and so you had, and Phil Irwin comes back to report, you know. And so everybody's ready to go. They got the guys kicked the door down the whole bit, you know, and he says, she's there. So uh, Barney Radisky, who owned the Plymouth House, uh, and he was a, a New York cop that came out, and he got a license as a private investigator. He never worked the case, but he was in, it was his license. And so, anyway, they, they, uh, Sinatra, DiMaggio, Barney Radisky, Jimmy, a couple of other guys, a photographer, they, they all go to the, this, this apartment. And so uh, Radisky says, uh, here's the door, kick it down, Jimmy. And Phil says, wait a minute. Barney, that's not the door. He says, I'm in charge. These guys have been drinking. They're drunk, you know, and, and except for Phil. This is the only time Phil wasn't drunk in his life, you know, and, and so he said, it's the wrong door. He says, I'm in charge. He says, you may be in charge, but you never worked it. I'm telling you, that's the day. He said, oh, hell, I kick it down myself. So he kicks the door down. It's dark in there. Sinatra goes over and flips on the light, and then everybody comes rushing. The little old lady watching television, she looks up. There's Frank Sinatra, Joe DiMaggio, all these guys. <laughs> and so Marilyn and her friend, here's the racket. And so, you know, they, they hit the fire escape and they never catch them, you know. And, and so uh, and James says, well, Fred Otash worked that job. I said, bullshit. It was, it was Phil Irwin. And, and he says, well, but Fred Otash took credit for it. And I said, Fred Otash took credit for a lot of things, did he? He says, you're right. So anyway, I left the book with him. A year later, he calls. And uh, the Cole 6000 had come out. And he says, listen, i got to have you for, the, for my third book. I got to have you and the wheelman in it, and so you know. I mean, it's like I wished it to happen. He really dug it. It's the first time he's had a real live character uh, in his book, and uh, so anyway, it's, it's a great honor for me. I got to tell you that. Was a question. We're listening. How autobiographical is this character, though? Is it part of you, too? It's the one thing that we don't answer is what's real and what's not. <laughs> okay. <in this> book. <laughs> Frank had adventures he really had. Some of them were my adventures, some of the peeping shit, frankly, <laughs> I did. It's not like I haven't written about it before. Yeah. It is a reconstruction of American history between 1968 and 1972. It is utterly seamless. Gay Edgar Hoover's in there. <laughs> Howard Hughes, also known as Dracula because mm -hmm. he drank Mormon purified blood. <laughs> Tricky Dick Nixon is in there. You're going to dig it. You buy a lot of copies. I've Good dug guarantee it. Guarantee you. <laughs> front row seat and have it. Man in the back, yeah. I'm interested in terms of L.A. late 60s. Is there a reason why you didn't use Manson? There's no reason to have Manson in this book. Manson was a yawn. You want to read about Manson, read my earlier book, Killer on the Road, he does a walk-off. <laughs> your, your, your historical view is, is pretty revisionist. I mean, it's very yeah. unusual. Yeah. How, how do you research? Where do you get, I mean, I'm looking at a, a, a biography of Mickey Cohen here. I know he plays a big part in a lot of your books. I mean, where did you find this information? How did you... How did you I do sketchy research. I hire... 
researchers who compile fact sheets and chronologies so that I won't write myself into actual